Chapter 9. Awake to Activism Our planet's illness is severe. It can only be healed through fundamental change. We must change not just our government and our technology, but our culture, our way of relating to one another, human nature itself. Our goal is not simply to recover or to repair the system. It never really was working well anyway. Its inherent flaws led to the current crises, and even before these crises it was hurting many people. As Stephen Dedalus said, history is a nightmare from which I am trying to awaken. Our goal must be to build a new world, better than any that we can remember, better than any that we have yet imagined. Knowledge grows exponentially, so things are changing faster and faster. It's up to us to steer the direction of that change. It may be helpful to study and discuss the few bits of old maps that we have, but even together they don't reveal our road or our destination. We must find the courage to follow our hearts. They are all we have for a compass. We are engaged in a race between worldwide enlightenment and the consolidation of ancient greed. The outcome is not yet determined, and so no one can afford to just sit on the sidelines and watch. We will survive this metamorphosis, and we will remake this planet into a kinder, gentler place if we work together. But many are not working with us, for a variety of reasons. They feel it's not urgent, but this essay says otherwise. They're spectators, but they're needed on the field. They have little time, but soon they'll have less. They're distracted by consumerism. Hey, wake up! They feel powerless, but together we are strong. They feel hopeless, but the future is not yet written. They are confused. Well, start learning. You and I must wake those people and recruit them. For those who despair, we must offer hope. Here are a few pointers in that direction. Culture has changed before, and with it human nature. Therefore, it can change again. Already the movement for change is enormous, bigger than any previous movement in history. And if progress currently is not visible, don't let that discourage you. Consciousness grows beneath the surface, until finally it passes a threshold level and bursts forth into view at a moment no one can accurately predict. For instance, no one foresaw the timing of the Freedom Riders in 1961, nor the timing of the fall of the Berlin Wall in, in 1989. Thomas Hobbes and Sigmund Freud were pessimistic about human nature, but they were mistaken. There is growing evidence that humans are basically empathic and cooperative. John Stewart has pointed out that we routinely cooperate with one another in every aspect of our lives except politics. If you're looking at the transcript page, at this point you'll also find links to some uplifting works of Rifkin and Solnit. We are smarter together than separately, and perhaps we will be wiser, too. The Internet has given Gaia a consciousness like never before. The human brain is a hundred billion neurons networked in parallel, and Facebook is almost a billion human brains networked in parallel, and Facebook is not the final word in networking. Look inside yourself and your friends to see love and the capacity for change. Then remember that everyone else is like that too, for all humans are your cousins, your flesh and blood. Admittedly, uprising involves risk. Revolution is no picnic. Four students were killed by National Guardsmen in the uprising at Kent State University in 1970. Far greater numbers of dissidents have been killed or imprisoned in other countries where the rulers are more brutal. And the USA may be heading toward that kind of brutality if the justifying myths of our rulers continue to decline in credibility. But silence is complicity and an increasing number of U.S.ers can no longer bear to be complicit in our nation's crimes against humanity and against the ecosystem. Some are as willing to risk their lives for the truths of peace as ordinary soldiers do when persuaded by the lies of war. More U.S.ers are growing aware of how we have been exploited and sucked dry by the wealthy. 
They are recognizing that it's time to fight back, that we have little left to lose. And even if an uprising is crushed, it's not a complete loss. It still changes the consciousness of society. As some Egyptians said after their partially successful uprising in Tahrir Square, if things don't work out the way we want them, we know the way back to Tahrir Square. Some believe that violence is never a wise tactic, and others believe that sometimes violence is necessary. But regardless of the broader theory, I believe that right now, here in the USA, violence is not a helpful tactic. We are still in protest, not in civil war. At present, we do still have some freedom of speech and of the press, and we need to use it to increase our numbers. And ultimately, we may not need to use any violence at all. The bureaucracy of brutality cannot persist without the acquiescence of the public. And so that bureaucracy may fall without our firing a shot when its workers awaken and walk out, when the cops see the light and join our side. But until that time comes, we must recognize that our opponents will use force as they see the crumbling of the only world they have ever known. The cops will believe they are defending society from chaos, and some of them will use violence to suppress our message. And we'd better be psychologically prepared for that. Try to run away from the batons and rubber bullets. But if you must get assaulted, try to get it on camera. Our opponent's violence will expose the emptiness of their principles, as long as we don't respond with violence. Of course, it is possible that at some point our last vestiges of speech and press will be ripped away from us, and our opponent's violence will no longer be exposed. Perhaps that is the point at which we are forced from protest into war, and our analysis of violence becomes more complicated then. I don't have that part figured out yet. But even if we do come to violence, that must be only a temporary tactic. We must strive to avoid becoming like our opponents, who use force to impose their dogma. We must not replace the old oligarchy with a new one. Our primary goal is not to seize physical power. In fact, we seek a world in which physical power doesn't play a role. Our goal is to spread ideas, raise awareness, overcome the consensus trance, and build love. If we do seize the armory, it must be only to enable us to liberate the television station. Organizing and planning are major parts of revolution. The spontaneity of revolution is mostly just a myth. For instance, when Rosa Parks refused to go to the back of the bus, it wasn't simply because one day she got fed up. In fact, it was after much training and planning, particularly at the Highlander Center in Tennessee. But personally, I'm more a poet than a general, and I don't know much about organizing and planning. I'm not a leader, and I don't want to be one. Whenever leaders get a big following, they tend to either get corrupted or assassinated. But Victor Hugo said, No army is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. I'm hoping that we'll have good ideas spreading through a peer-to-peer -peer network that doesn't depend on leaders. Organizing and planning requires a lot of communication, which will be difficult if the authoritarian hierarchy is spying on you and censoring your communications, and locking you up when they don't like some of your communications. Still, it's my hope that our message of empathy and solidarity will fly beneath their radar. In Tolkien's novel, The Lord of the Rings, the evil Lord Sauron was defeated partly because he could not imagine that little Frodo, having acquired the Ring of Power, would seek to destroy it rather than wield it, and so Sauron took little precaution against that possibility. I think that people can't really see enlightenment without becoming enlightened. I've set my email program's options so that at the bottom of every message I send out, this line is added. I hope they will tap my phone and email. When they understand what we're saying, they'll join us. Join the struggle. Join the network. Join the movement, in whatever way feels right for you. That's going to be something different for everyone. Put peace symbols on your clothing and on your coins. 
and put longer piece messages on your paper money. Host screenings of films. If you have the tools and skills, make some films yourself. And by the way, this slideshow of mine is essentially a zero-budget production. I didn't use a video camera. I don't even have one. Join a national organization if you can find one you believe in. More importantly, join a local organization, one small enough that everyone gets a turn to speak. You'll feel greatly empowered once you become part of a community and part of the conversation steering that community. Or just talk with people, online or off. Our basic problem is a lack of understanding, and so the solution must be in the global conversation. And action doesn't even depend on being part of an organization. You can act in concert with just a few friends, or even alone. For instance, sometimes I stand alone by a roadside during rush hour, holding up a big sign. Thousands of people see it, even if the corporate news media never acknowledge it at all. Many people have spoken of the usefulness of protest demonstrations, but I think I've heard it put most eloquently by Richard Wolff. Never underestimate the impact of even a small number of people doing something. It means thousands of others who see it, who hear about it, now have a more realistic feeling about such a thing. It may take them several more months or years before they ever go. But the possibility of their going just got a little more real when they see you standing there doing it. It's not as strange, it's not as hopeless, it's not as impossible, because it's been realized by another person who's not so different from them. It's very, very powerful. And if you're more into the stealth by night variety of tactics, the Freeway Blogger website has great instructions. As the Freeway Blogger has stated, when you put up a sign on the freeway, people will read it until someone takes it down. Perhaps what we need most of all is inspiration. Logical reasoning might win people's passive consent, but it won't get them moving. If you can articulate more clearly what is happening in all our lives, so that we understand our own experience better, you will empower us all. As John Lennon and Harvey Milk both said, Tell them what they are feeling. We must dream big and see with new eyes. It's true that the anti-authoritarian revolution of the 1960s failed because we didn't know what we were doing. But at least, for a little while, we shed the cynicism and weariness that now pervades so much of our society. The stage screen musical Hair was full of anthems for us. The hippies, yippies, and zippies were not peripheral to the movement. They were at its heart. A large group accompanied Abby Hoffman and Allen Ginsberg when they tried to levitate the Pentagon. And ultimately, we did help to end a war. Today we're led by creaky old men. I treasure the wisdom and pragmatism of Chomsky and Nader, but they are not enough. Emma Goldman said, If I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your revolution. And I think I'm beginning to understand what she meant. Building the movement is hard work, and we won't keep doing it for long unless we're enjoying it. We must remember how to moon the man, how to thumb our noses at our jailers, how to be joyfully free in our spirit regardless of our physical chains. That spirit is not dead. Look at the yes-men and the flash mob singing protesters. But it has become all too rare. Search for it in yourself. Each of us knows only part of the song. Keep listening and keep singing. Wait a minute! I can't shop here! Target's playing games with our political system. Target ain't people, so why should it be allowed to play around with our democracy? Target ain't people, so why should it be that they should play around with our democracy? <laughs> Get away, we're gonna make them and the people so
why should it 